Hello, welcome to my presentation on the hourglass model of EvoDevo and how it extends to positive selection on enhancers. First, I would like to thank uh, you for inviting me and thank Irpan for organizing this cool session on preprints. I think that's a great idea and I'm thankful to have the opportunity to present ours. This work was mostly done by Jeline Yu, a student who was then under my supervision in Lausanne and is now in Basel and is a collaboration with the lab of Aileen Furlong at the EMBL. So the title says the hourglass. What is the hourglass model of Ipodivo? Well, simply put, it is the observation that in mid-development, there is a developmental period where embryos of different species look much more similar than earlier or later embryonic periods. This period is called the phylotypic period because typically the embryos look most similar within a phylum, such as among vertebrates, among arthropods, or among nematodes. So different arthropod embryos would look similar within the phylotypic period. This was originally observed in the 1990s anatomically on the appearance of the embryos and some um, groundbreaking papers 10 years ago showed that this extended to molecular phenotypes. And notably, there was a paper by Kalinka and co-authors in 2010, which measured gene expression divergence between closely related species of Drosophila across embryonic development and showed that in early and late development, you have more divergence of expression between species, but in mid-development, at the phylotypic period, the period where the embryos look most similar between species anatomically, you also had the most conservation of gene expression. So this means that this anatomical similarity comes from the genome through gene expression. Gene expression what allows the genome to guide the embryo embryonic development, obviously. And so here we want to go beyond this observation of a molecular phenotype to understanding the genomic underpinnings. So the first thing to understand is, is gene reg does gene regulation follow an hourglass? Indeed, if gene expression is more conserved at a certain stage, then the regulation of the genes at this stage are expected to also be more conserved. So for this, the lab of Aileen Furlong generated DNA seq in five stages of development in two species of flies, Drosophila virilis and Drosophila melanogaster. And these five stages span embryonic development, including the phylotypic period, which is the middle of the five, the third. And this allowed them to call peaks of, of DNA seq, which are putative enhancers. And you see that we get thousands of peaks at each developmental stage in each species. So the first question now is, are these enhancers more conserved in the phylotypic period as expected if enhancers explain the hourglass that we see at gene expression and anatomical level. To do this, we need to be able to compare the putative enhancers between the species. So what we do is that we align the genomes. So this is an autologous region of genome between melanogaster and virilis. And what we observe in this case is that this autologous region here in melanogaster has a very specific enhancer of stage three, so the phylotypic period. And in very least, this, the autologous region also has a very specific enhancer of stage three. So this is a stage three specific conserved enhancer with very uh, clear autologous alignment. So that's our most stringent definition of conservation. We also use some more relaxed ones, which I won't show here. And lo and behold, we find what was expected from the model, stronger conservation of enhancers at the phylotypic period, both with a strict conservation definition and a more relaxed one. So this shows that the hourglass pattern with the strong conservation of the phylotypic period is true not only anatomically, not only at gene expression, which is the phenotype linking the genome to the anatomy, but also at the regulation in the genome of this uh, expression. So here we have explained, we've gone one step further mechanistically. Can we also go one step further from an evolutionary biology point of view? If the stage is more conserved, it might be due to natural selection. And so how can we check this? Well, natural selection has two main forms which can explain such a pattern. Purifying selection or negative selection removes deleterious mutations, slows down evolution, and is relatively easy to detect because it leads to things being conserved. 
And we see indeed this conservation and we have from other uh, lines of evidence, plenty of evidence that there is strong purifying selection in the phylotypic period. But another form of natural selection which can explain at least in part such patterns is positive selection. Positive selection is a section which drives new changes if they're adaptive, if they improve the fitness of the organism. And if we have strong positive selection, strong adaptation in early and late development, but very little adaptation in middle development, then we would also have slower evolution in middle development. But positive selection is harder to detect because it leads to change and neutral drift also leads to change and we have to disentangle to distinguish them. You've probably heard of DNDS, which allows in protein coding genes to distinguish change from drift and change from positive selection by using the synonymous changes as a neutral reference. But we don't have such a neutral reference and for regulatory sequences and for years, it was a problem to measure positive selection at the regulatory level. And that's where our bioinformatics competence really enter the picture. We developed a method which we published last year to detect positive selection in regulatory sequences. Very briefly, if you take a set of uh, experimentally determined regulatory sequences, for example, here, chip seek of transcription factor binding, you can fit a, a model by machine learning and distinguish uh, regulatory sequence from non-regulatory sequence. What interests us here is not to do this distinguish, but to use the model. Because what the model does notably is that it produces a score, and it's been shown that the higher the score, the stronger the regulatory activity of the regulatory element. So we have a purely computational measure of how strongly active a regulatory element is. And why is this interesting? Because when a regulatory sequence evolves, it accumulates mutations. If it's evolving neutrally, if it's accumulating these mutations just because they're not bad, they're not removed by purifying selection, then some of the mutations fix will increase a bit the activity, some will decrease it a bit, and on average, it won't change too much. But if there is natural selection, adaptation, positive selection, then this will drive the re regulatory element towards a higher activity or drive it towards a lower activity. In this case, most or all of the mutations fixed will be increasing the activity or most or all of the mutations fixed will be decreasing the activity. And so we will get an overall change from the mutations we observe, very different from random. And so we compare the mutations which we observe and their effect on the machine learning score to a random set of mutations which have similar properties. So we compare the impact on the score of the set of mutations we actually observe for a regulatory element on a branch of the phylogeny to what we would obtain, observe with a similar number of mutations with similar properties, but by chance, randomizing them. And from this, we can get a test for part of selection. And we have shown in our previous paper that this uh, fits the expectations of natural selection from population genetics. Now, in the previous example we published, we used it on chip seek of transcription factors. And we expect transcription factor binding sites to have very strong information in their sequence. So to be very amenable to this approach. But it was not at all clear to me that this would work for DNA seq for enhancers, which are much more broadly defined, much less specific in sequence. And yet when we tried it, it did work. So here you have the rock curves for uh, training the model on five different developmental stages. And first, you see that these rock curves are not too bad. And second here, for example, on the first stage, you see that if we train the model on enhancers from early development, they predict very well enhancers from early development. If we train the model on enhancers from the second stage, they predict not too bad, but less well the enhancers from the first stage. If we train them on later stages, they don't predict anything. So this shows that not only do enhancers contain in their DNA sequence the information of being an enhancer, but this contains biological information on the stage specificity of the enhancers. Early enhancers have different properties in their DNA sequence than late or middle development enhancers. So there's really biological information in this DNA sequence, which is very important to us because it means that there is a substrate for natural selection to act. Mutations here will change the function. And it means we can detect it with our method. So under the hourglass 
model, we expect that the lowest positive selection will be in middle development because that's what evolves the slowest and positive section accelerates. So what do we see? It is very striking. We see very low positive selection in middle development. The phylotypic period is characterized by very low positive selection on the enhancers. This would not be very exciting if in general we didn't find any positive selection, but the second observation here is that we find very high amounts up to above 40% of enhancers which evolved under positive selection in the recent evolution of melanogaster flies. So this means that positive selection is an important player in the evolution of development of flies. And that's a very interesting result actually, it was not necessarily totally expected. If you work on vertebrates, don't get too excited. It's well known that natural selection is much more efficient in flies than in most other animals because of the very large population sizes. But still, it's a very interesting observation. And the third observation we can make here is that enhancers which were conserved between melanogaster and virides have less positive selection than enhancers which are new to melanogaster relative to virides which implies that at least some of these new enhancers were fixed by positive selection. So it's not just a neutral turnover. It's not just that these enhancers are false positives, it's that there is adaptive value to fixing these new enhancers in evolution. So overall, what we see is that we have a very clear extension of the hourglass to regulatory sequences in fly evo evo, and that this is explained both by more purifying selection and especially interesting, lower positive selection, whereas positive selection is quite important to adaptation of early development and late development of flies. Thank you for your attention. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna start reading some, some of the questions that people are starting to, to post. So the first one is, um, are the phylotypic stage enhancers enriched for certain kinds of genes? Hmm, that's a good question. We actually didn't look. so. There's all, it's always complicated. We didn't go into the, the question of linking these enhancers to genes because that's always complicated. It's not always the nearest gene. So we didn't actually, we didn't look at this in this case. In a previous work, we showed that um, there were more uh, conserved non-coding elements. So long stretches of DNA, which could be enhancers, uh, which are conserved between species close to genes expressed in the phylotypic period and especially transcription factors expressed in the phylotypic period. But we didn't do it for these. Okay. I see that there's question in the Q&A question in the chat, so I'm not sure which is... Yes, which... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask one on the chat, but I remind people, please, to use the Q&A box. Uh, so this question from Jesse Ben Vliet. Probably I didn't pronounce that properly. Are the stage three enhancers enriched for for pleiotropic enhancers? So he means a phylotypic stage enhancers. So by pleiotropic, um, it depends. So how do you define it? So here we looked specifically at enhancers which were specific of one developmental stage. So they are not in the other developmental stage. So they're not pleiotropic in the sense of cross development. We did this only on fly whole bodies. So we didn't look whether they're pleiotropic across uh, tissues. What we did do is cross this data with information on tissue specific enhancers, although the, we only had three tissues, so it was very rough. And surprisingly, we didn't see any specific pattern that we expected something, but we didn't see any pattern related to the, the tissues where these enhancers are expressed. Again, we had very low resolution, so I, I wouldn't, wouldn't think this is the end of the story. Uh, we have shown in previous works and also others have shown that genes which are expressed at the phylotypic period and are conserved are more often pleiotropic in their expression, but that was not on enhancers. We have much more information on gene expression on enhancers, so it's kind of more at the beginning here. We don't have so much information on enhancers at different stages and different tissues, so I would expect something like that, but I don't have hard evidence. 